Hello everyone, my name is Will Cully from Cornell University, and in this video I will go through the pre-analysis for compressible flow in a nozzle. In this problem, we will be looking at a converging diverging nozzle with given pressure conditions at the inlet and the outlet. The geometry of the nozzle is defined by the following variation in circular cross-sectional area. Using Fluent, we will investigate the resulting Mach number variations, static and total pressure, and static and total temperature variations. And we will verify our results by comparing them to an analytical solution. We will interpret the solution process using this black box framework. We start with our physical problem, which is flow in a nozzle. From this, we can use physical principles and assumptions to create a mathematical model inside the fluent black box. It figures out this model from our user inputs. Let's take a look at the mathematical model. This consists of governing equations and boundary conditions. For governing equations, we first have the continuity equation, which is conservation of mass applied to an infinitesimal fluid element. Here it is represented using vector notation. Next, we have a conservation of momentum equation, which arises from applying F equals MA to an infinitesimal fluid element. Expanding this vector notation produces two equations, one in each of our coordinate directions. For an incompressible model, these three equations would be sufficient to close the equation set for the three unknown functions, being the coordinate direction velocities and the pressure P. For a compressible simulation, however, we have an added unknown, the density. This means that an additional equation needs to be added to close the equation set. To do this, we introduce the conservation of energy equation for an infinitesimal fluid element. This provides a fourth equation, shown here, that would be enough to solve for our four unknowns. But, it adds an additional unknown from the temperature term. Therefore, to fully close the equation set, we introduce the equation of state, the ideal gas law. This provides a fifth equation for our five unknowns. These unknown functions are pressure, two velocity components corresponding to our 2D geometry, density, and temperature. This model also includes important assumptions. The axisymmetric assumption allows us to represent this geometry as 2D and use the velocity component shown here. This will be shown in more detail on the next slide. The steady assumption knocks off any time varying terms in the governing equations, which are not displayed here for simplicity. The inviscid assumption removes any viscous force terms and heat conduction, as shown here. We make this assumption because, since the Reynolds number for this high speed flow is large, the viscous effects will be confined to a small part of the flow near the wall and can therefore be neglected. Finally, the ideal gas assumption allows us to use the ideal gas law as the equation of state to close the system. As mentioned, we will model the nozzle using a 2D axisymmetric geometry. This means we will only model the 2D shape shown here and a full 3D model can be created by revolving this shape around the axis of symmetry. In Fluent, this justifies the use of a cylindrical coordinate system, with the axial direction being labeled Z and the radial direction being labeled R. Note that the geometry visualizations in ANSYS will make this change under the hood, but it will not be directly visible. This means that we need to mentally replace the x-axis in Fluent 
with the axial z axis and the y axis with the radial r axis. Using this cylindrical coordinate system, our full model can be defined with r, theta, and z. This means our general velocity vectors will have three components in each coordinate direction. The axisymmetric assumption, however, means that there is no variation in the rotational theta direction, so we can cross out our theta terms. Our velocity vector can then be simply decomposed into a radial and axial component. And all of our unknown functions are assumed to only vary with these two coordinates. It is also important to note that the use of a cylindrical coordinate system impacts our governing equations. All vector operations, like the del operator, must therefore be interpreted in cylindrical coordinates. In addition to the governing equations, our mathematical model includes boundary conditions. The domain of our boundary value problem is the fluid region inside the nozzle. The left side will be our inlet. We will specify the stagnation pressure and temperature along this boundary, along with the direction of the velocity. The right side will be the outlet. Here we will specify the static pressure. This pressure difference will drive the flow from the inlet to the exit. Next, we want to add a boundary condition to the edge of the nozzle. While we would typically enforce a no-slip and no-penetration boundary condition at this wall, the no-slip condition cannot be enforced for inviscid flow. We will therefore only enforce the no-penetration boundary condition. This means that the velocity of the fluid normal to the curve must be zero. Finally, the bottom line will be the symmetry axis for our axisymmetric model. Here, we set the radial velocity to zero, and all derivatives with respect to the radial component to zero. This means that we only expect variations along the axis at the symmetry boundary. This completes our overview of the mathematical model. So we can now take a look at a brief overview of the numerical solution strategy that will be used to obtain values of our unknown functions in the domain. To begin this process, we need to divide the domain up into multiple control volumes, called cells. This image shows a photo of a sample mesh of the flow domain inside the nozzle, with each of these boxes being a unique control volume. From this, we will determine values of the unknown functions at the center of each of these cells. This value will be an approximation of the average value of the cell. For other regions not in the center, we can approximate its value by interpolating between cell center values. That means that anywhere in the cell, even on the boundary, the values can be interpolated from the value at the center and other neighboring values. To get these values, the fluid solver will derive algebraic equations relating the primary unknowns at each cell center to the neighboring values. This will create a system of equations. The solver will then invert this system to obtain the cell center values. Importantly, the solver only directly determines values of our primary unknowns. All other quantities and visualizations are post-processed from these values. To develop and solve these equations, Fluent uses the finite volume method. It starts with the mathematical model, which we know is the differential form of our governing equations and associated boundary conditions. It needs to develop algebraic equations relating cell center values of the primary unknowns. To do this, it first goes to the integral form of the governing equations and applies it to each control volume. The process of developing these algebraic equations introduces a discretization error, 
caused by only finding the values at cell centers. We can reduce this error by refining the mesh. These algebraic equations are nonlinear, so to solve them, Fluent must linearize them about guess values. Doing this introduces a linearization error. This process is performed iteratively by continuously updating the guess values, and we repeat this until the imbalance falls below a selected tolerance. For more information about this process, check out the eCornell Certificate for Computational Fluid Dynamics. Back in our black box framework, we have discussed the mathematical model and the numerical solution method and how that produces the selected values at selected points. Now, I want to show an analytical method of solving this problem that we can use to gain intuition on the expected results and verify the solution. The flow through the nozzle can be simplified to gain intuition by using a quasi-1D analysis. For this, we assume that the cross-sectional area A changes slowly in the axial direction, which is labeled as X here. This means that even though we know the area changes, we assume that the flow does not change direction significantly as the area varies. This means we neglect flow variations in every direction but in the x direction. This leads to all unknown functions being only properties of x, meaning that they are uniform across a cross section. Notice that this also reduces the total number of unknown functions to 4, as we no longer have a velocity component in the radial direction. Using this, Along with the assumptions made previously in our CFD model, the governing equations can be simplified and solved analytically. This table shows a comparison of the quasi-1D analytical approach versus the CFD numerical approach. For our unknown functions, as mentioned above, we have one fewer unknown for the analytical approach. Additionally, they have been reduced to be functions of only the x-coordinate, instead of the axial and radial coordinates. Similarly, we now also have one fewer governing equation in the analytical case, because only one momentum equation is necessary. The numerical approach needs two momentum equations to find both of its velocity components. While the numerical solution uses many control volumes from the discretized domain, the analytical approach treats the whole nozzle as a single control volume. While this analytical approach is useful to provide fundamental insights on the flow within a nozzle, the numerical approach can be generalized to any nozzle geometry and is adaptable to real flow conditions. We will compare the results of our numerical approach to this analytical case after the simulation is complete. This completes the pre-analysis content, and we will now get into the simulation.